Our next speaker I'm pleased to announce is Senator Bill Cassidy. Senator Bill Cassidy is an American politician and the junior United States Senator from the state of Louisiana. He is a member of the Republican Party and served as the U.S. Representative for Louisiana's 6th Congressional District from 2009 to 2015 prior to becoming a Senator. He is a physician, he is a gastroenterologist by training and a hepatologist. And Senator Cassidy is going to be discussing improving electronic health records for physicians. So Senator Cassidy, thank you for joining us. I know you're very busy and we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. We look forward to your presentation. So thank you so much. First, electronic medical records have been around with us for a long time. Uh, um, as you can see from this slide, beginning back in 1968 is when you could establish the roots. Uh, but going to the next slide, please. If you look at what really brought us into our current environment, it was the High Tech Act of 2009. And the vision was to get a nationwide HIT infrastructure that would cause, that would create a safer and more coordinated care. At the time, I was thinking this is fantastic. After Hurricane Katrina, there were so many patients displaced in the middle of chemotherapy or on complicated therapeutic regimens that a doctor in Oklahoma would email me and I would be able to, um, and he would be able to draw down the information as to the medicines my patient was receiving because of an electronic medical record. The promise of the EHR is tremendous. Now, the High Tech Act provided lots of financial subsidies for, to encourage providers to use electronic medical records, and clearly if the prevalence of physicians using electronic medical records is the goal, you can see from that bottom bullet point the goal was achieved. That said, um, um, along with this came what is called, as we all know, meaningful use. It isn't just that you have it, it is that you use it. And you use it in what was defined by someone in Washington, D.C. in a meaningful way. Unfortunately, we've not been as successful as that. So here we see that 96% of hospitals are registered in meaningful use. But as you see in these pie graphs, 55% uh, have not met meaningful, meaningful use stage one. 64% have not reached meaningful use stage two. So even though there is penetration in use, by at least how it's defined by meaningful use standards, uh, it's not being used meaningfully. Uh, next slide, please. And I will also say, as a physician, there is a cost to pay for this. The most highly compensated person in this equation, the physician, is now spending so much of her time entering data on an electronic medical record. I'm always a little amused. I still see patients in a clinic in a teaching hospital, and I'll ask someone if the patient has had an, appendec an appendectomy. Instead of looking on the abdomen for a scar, they're just as likely to look on the computer to see if it's recorded. The other thing I note is that many notes are cut and pasted. I'm not quite sure that complete review of systems and physical examination is being redone. I do know it's being cut and pasted, implying that it was redone. There are a lot of issues associated with this. 70% uh, of physicians say electronic medical records are not worth it, and 45% say that patient care has worsened since implementation. I was in a committee hearing, Al Franken, the senator from Minnesota, uh, looks over and says, is it just you old guys with gray hair who don't, use, know, who don't know how to use computers that are complaining about this? Uh, and, and obviously he's suggesting it might be a generational thing, uh, and I being the old guy. So let's go to the next slide. No, if you do a time analysis, there is a cost of EHRs. On this pie chart, uh, physicians are spending, uh, let's look at it, um, direct patient contact is 25% of their time. Documenting their work, 31% of the time, uh, and we can go through like that. But we're spending more time documenting work than we are touching the patient. Next slide. 
and the time is lost in the patient-physician interaction. Going back to Senator Franken's, is it just the fellow that doesn't know how to use the mouse? Interns, who presumably, of all of us, are most facile at using electronics in general, it shows that 12% that of their time is spent in patient care, eight minutes per day per patient. 40% of their time is on the computer documenting. Wow. Eight minutes per patient, 40% documenting. Uh, I'm trying to remember the old William Osler quote, that a physician cures rarely but comforts always. How do you comfort a patient with a terrible diagnosis if you're spending on average eight minutes a day with her? Uh, physicians spending 15 hours a week documenting. EHR documentation takes three to four times much, as much time as dictation. And during a 10-hour ER shift, with a doctor seeing 2.5 patients per hour, a physician will click a computer 4,000 times, coming up with a term called click fatigue. This is not good for patient care. Marcy Zwellin is with you in Chicago right now. Marcy always emphasizes the centrality of the patient-physician relationship. When I try and explain to non-medical colleagues what all this means, I say, imagine someone has cancer. My wife's a general surgeon specialized in breast cancer, but we've all had these conversations. You look into the patient's eye and you give the diagnosis and you watch to make sure they comprehend everything you're saying. And if there ever there's a point where she's not comprehending or her husband is not comprehending, you pull back and you go back over, emphasizing the hopefulness, the cure, the potential for a normal life, if that potential exists. And that's what comes from spending time with that patient. In the electronic medical record world, you're clicking, counseled patient, counseled patient and spouse regarding diagnosis, click. Made referral, click. Ordered test, click. There's a friend of mine in Lafayette, Louisiana, Dr. David Foreman, who bought an electronic medical record and as an ENT surgeon doing lots of cancer, stopped using it because he found that he no longer was looking at someone in the eyes communicating what she or he needed to know about their diagnosis. On kind of a humorous note, but very much a real note, I'm a hepatologist. I talk to people about risk factors for liver disease. And if I'm gonna ask someone about risk factors, I put my pencil down, put my chart down, I look, I make, I make it with body language, um, uh, speaking to them everything I can that what we're about to discuss is personal. And I'll ask them about risk factors for, um, for uh, risk factors for liver disease, sexually transmitted disease, a distant history of intravenous drug use, etc. Now, excuse me, can you tell me if you've ever used drugs? Click, <laughs> and you laugh because you can only imagine the patient's perception. That just got put into the cloud. Who's going to access this? Now you can reassure them. You can say, don't worry, this is as safe as if the information was being stored by the Office of Personnel Management in the federal government. At which case, they walk out the room uh, understanding that there is no safety to their data. So I think there's a lot of challenges we have if we really want to maintain the centrality of that patient-physician relationship as we use the electronic medical record. By the way, when I speak to my colleagues, the ones that get what I just said are the ones who have had cancer because they understand how special it was to have their physician speak to them in a way which um, reassured them and brought them hope. Um, now, that said, next slide. What are our goals of interoperability? Because, by the way, if we could get interoperability, that is a good thing. Going back to when my patient was displaced to Oklahoma and could maintain his medical regimen because records were so easily obtainable by the physician in Oklahoma City. Um, ideally, we would be able to clinically use information that has been gathered in whatever setting 
and it's put into a central place where the patient comes in to Oklahoma City and I'm able to log in and say, oh look, this was the chemotherapy regimen they were receiving. I can't reach this patient's physician, but I certainly have the patient's records and now I can continue without a hiccup the therapeutic regimen that they were on. We could decrease redundancy and medication errors. Don't need to repeat the CT scan because the previous CT scan was a week ago. Um, uh, and that, of course, would improve patient safety, continuity of care, and efficiency. There's also something called, this is the nirvana, semantic, semantic interoperability. A good example of this, somebody with blood pressure gets their blood pressure checked in multiple settings, perhaps even at home, goes up to the electronic medical record, and wherever they go, it would come out like a flow sheet. Uh, it would be their blood pressure and the their pulse and the medications they were on over a year's time, and it would all be put in a narrative that was clinically useful, even though the blood pressure may have been obtained in 16 different settings. That is nirvana. We are nowhere close to that. I smile a little bit. In 1983, fax machines were being used and we thought it was fantastic. I could take a discharge summary, a, a clinical flow sheet, and some med pages, fax it to a hospital where my patient was being seen, and the doc would have everything that she needed to know regarding that particular patient. We had testimony in the Senate recently, and a doc from Michigan, or a group from Michigan, who's done really good work, said, oh, we've realize that we're not going to get complete interoperability, but one thing we've done with our electronic medical record, we're able to transfer discharge summaries, plans of care, medication lists, etc. And I thought we have spent $30 billion to replace a fax machine. That is not nirvana. That is not where we need to end up. We need to be far more demanding of what is going to take place. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges to interoperability. First, uh, information blocking. Sometimes providers, doctors and hospitals will not release the data of a patient to another provider. It may be because they are concerned about HIPAA or it may be they are concerned about losing a patient. And so if it's the latter, if it's the former, then we need reassurances that you can have interoperability without sacrificing your HIPAA protection. But if it is the latter, where a provider just doesn't want to use a patient, it is actually the patient's data. It is not the provider's. That is wrong, and we have to overcome that. Probably a bigger problem, though, is information blocking by vendors. A vendor trying to improve market share will not trade data with another vendor's product and hoping that the other hospital will end up buying their system, the first hospital's system, because that way that's the only way they can have access to this data. It is a business model which it is alleged that some of the biggest players in the electronic medical record world are using business practices to deny access the data. Um, uh, by the way, it can also occur that if a physician doesn't like his electronic medical record and wishes to change to another, that the vendor will block access to the data, not allowing it to be transferred to the new program. That leads to the next issue of interoperability challenges, that is contracting. Uh, right now, physicians and hospitals, not used to this, are purchasing systems, but the people selling the systems uh, are not necessarily entirely forthcoming about the cost of upgrades, the cost to transfer data, who owns the data, and many other things that have the potential to tie the provider to the vendor, even if the provider later becomes dissatisfied. Related to that is the question of who does own the data. And we need clear guidance. It is the patient that owns the data. And the provider has access to it. And the vendor cannot hold on to it. 
um, not releasing it uh, unless um, um, they're paid some large sum of money. Uh, that's wrong, and that's one of the things that has to be addressed if we're going to get to mean true meaningful use of electronic health records. Now there are some, next slide please, there are some things happening in the Congress to begin to address this. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Burgess, who may also be speaking with you, is a OBGYN from the Fort Worth area who serves in Congress on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And he has been working with the 21st Century Cures Bill that has just passed the House, it's coming to the Senate, to put in new interoperability standards and metrics, having a stronger certification process, and penalties to discourage information blocking, tying Medicaid, EHR, incentive payments to a lack of information blocking practices. We will have something similar on the Senate side. My staff and I are writing a bill in which we are sending a message after $30 billion and physicians putting countless hours into implementing these electronic medical records, we don't want someone as a business practice limiting the usefulness or the promise of what an EHR can be. Um, so one of the things that Mike has suggested is to create an industry-based standard development organization which would recommend and periodically update interoperability standards. And if a physician, by the way, decided to opt out of a particular program because the program is being decertified, let's imagine there is a vendor who will not allow, allow interoperability and lose the certification of their product, that the a physician who now has a decertified project would be uh, held harmless from meaningful use uh, or any other penalties that might be associated with that action. So we're trying to balance how do we get those vendors to achieve the goals that we all wish to achieve, at the same time keep the physician from being caught in the crossfire. Now let's move on to meaningful use, because we referred how so 64% of hospitals are not achieving meaningful use too. Um, currently, meaningful use emphasizes processes. Um, uh, scripts signed electronically, patients accessing their own electronic medical record, uh, trying to get physicians to change their behavior, certifying functionality, but really no attention, minimal attention to clinical outcome improvement. I would also um, uh, argue, next slide, um, that providers have kind of been shut out of this process. So providers want patient-centered outcomes. Um, they want to tie these outcomes to interoperability and that we should certify interoperability. One good piece of advice I got, as one example of what colleagues have shared, there are some specialty societies that say that we should have meaningful use tied to, um, tied to what that specialty society does. One example, I was in a, in a hospital, in a clinic seeing a patient who had been recently discharged from the hospital. He had had a variceal bleed, he's yellow, he's got his belly full of ascites. I'm trying to manage his hyponatremia, his aldactone and Lasix to manage his ascites, and get him on his beta blockers so he doesn't have a variceal bleed, telling him how we need to schedule another endoscopy to do more esophageal variceal banding. And the meaningful use says, Ask him if he still smokes. <laughs> You're thinking, wait a second. I got, this fellow might die in the next six months, most likely will. I'm doing everything in my education to give him another chance. And this is what I'm spending my time with. It is not meaningful. It is a waste of time and detracts from the patient's ability to recover from his illness. So what registry societies have said is let's have meaningful use for our subspecialty defined by what we do. Imagine gastroenterology. Your registry would be how many times in a colonoscopy the endoscopist gets to the cecum, how many polyps are removed, 
Uh, what is the um, histologic, ba histologic outcome of that polyp at a later point? How many perforations? How oftentimes the scope has to be ended prematurely because of a poor prep? All those sorts of meaningful things for a gastroenterologist. Ideally, the gastroenterologist would enter this into the electronic medical record and it would automatically populate the registry. That would be promise. That would be interoperability with a registry. It would be clinic clinically useful and allowing, by the way, quality control among the group, but also for the group to go to payors and say, look at the quality of our work. Lots of things that would really benefit in this process. I will point out there's at least two vendors. Everyone else does it. There's, I think, 60 plus vendors of electronic medical records, but two of the largest have not cooperated so supposedly with this with this suspect with this specialty society in coming up with this process. So we have to have taking provider feedback, modification of my meaningful use, so it actually doesn't just look at functionality, but it actually improves quality and clinical outcomes. Next slide, please. Let's talk briefly about ICD-10. Um, we know that ICD-10 is 500% uh, greater increase in the number of codes, some completely no, new, cost being borne by practices. You see it up there. Cost for both individual uh, private practitioners or, or small solo practices as well as for large practices. And there had been an October 1st implementation deadline. Next slide. Let me compliment physicians. Physicians have been fantastic about coming to Washington, D.C., speaking with the administration, speaking with members of Congress and senators about the burden that this would be. Dr. Terry out of Alabama, tireless in coming and presenting as to the burden this would be upon small practices. Um, I say that because in our participatory democracy, if we as physicians are not participating, we are not going to have public policy that does focus upon clinical outcomes, that is mindful of a physician's time, that does focus on patient-physician relationships. You and I have to be involved. By definition, I am. Almost by definition, you are. You're attending this conference. But work to get your colleagues involved and at least we can say that this year's delay in the implementation of the penalties for ICD-10 is an example of how advocacy can work. Um, now let's go to the next slide. We are going to continue to work on these issues. Uh, I am on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Lamar Alexander is the chair, and his goal is that we would actually find solutions and not just complain. You'll see up on your slide a series of hearings that we've either had, uh, that we have had as regards electronic medical records, and we will have more going forward attempting to come up with solutions. They'll be somewhat similar to those that Dr. Burgess has offered in the 21st Century Secures. Some of them will be a little different. If you can contact my office or those of the other physicians who serve in Congress and the Senate, letting us know your real life concerns and examples, we can make this a better product. It is important for us as physicians, not only for our practice, but more importantly for our patients, because ultimately we are our patient's advocate. Thank you for having me. Senator Cassidy, this is Dr. Cravietto calling in from Keystone, Colorado. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you very well. You can hear me? I sure can. Hey, let me just first start out by thanking you for taking time out of your busy day and presenting at our conference. And I will just share this. I, I will just tell you, sir, that it is just so comforting for me to know as a physician that there is a, another physician who is a United States senator who understands what we as doctors go through and the trials we um, are faced with and the challenges each day and so I just want to thank you number one for your democratic participation as a physician um, and for you as a US senator and so I just want to thank you for that and I really appreciate your comments 
I do have a couple questions for you. Is that okay if I ask you a couple questions? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Let me just say this. Many experts have commented that our current evaluation and management coding system is responsible for the plethora of EHR drop-down menus and bullet points just to justify the level of the E&M code. And this is time-consuming. It leads to note bloat and these long notes. And it actually, if we're honest with each other, encourages upcoding. So I have two questions for you. One, do you think the current EMN codes need to be revamped and streamlined? And then along with that, do you think we should consider decoupling billing from EHR documentation, which in an instant would eliminate note bloat and get back to the physician just documenting what is pertinent? I think your second suggestion is fantastic. And let me tie this in to how you opened up your comment, that uh, there's someone up here that understands what you're going through. The people that wrote this were not physicians. They were not nurses. They were folks who are involved with insurance and with bureaucracy and with CMS and with maybe the idea to do population health and so they're very disrespectful of the physician's time. It is one more thing, wouldn't this be great, it's just one more thing. And there's 499 just one more things. So I agree with you totally. Uh, now in fairness, I met this past week with a CEO of one of the EHR companies. Her recommendation was is that if we come up with standardization, we invite docs in the room, not just the EHR people, but also physicians to come into the room and to say, this is how this system would work. Um, uh, we need to make it not driven by the hospital administrator or the guy who's pulling the strings up in Washington to have that one more thing. We need to have it driven by the people who are seeing the patients. Absolutely, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thank you for your comments, and I, I really um, appreciated your heartfelt comments as a physician. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and you know, when I'm telling someone that, that they have a serious diagnosis and I'm trying to communicate with them, I don't want to have to worry how many boxes on a computer I have to click. I want to, just like you said, look them in the eye and do what I do as a physician, a physician and a patient interacting together. and so. The computer's here to stay, and it's a powerful tool, but these EHR development companies need to understand what we do and how we do it. Um, and in that light, there was a question from the audience that was sent in by Dr. Dorio from Santa Clarita, and I'll just read it for you. He says, the basis for physician problems lay in legislation written by lobbyists and special interest groups. In what ways can we change the legislative mechanism and policy making that works against doctors and patients and the public in general? And I think you kind of spoke to that, but if you could respond to that. We as physicians have got to be engaged. Um, Mike Burgess, Tom Price, Bill Cassidy, John Fleming, Charles Estani, there's a Ralph Abraham, there are physicians in the House and the Senate now, John Barrasso. But if we're not engaged, we get hosed. And therefore, our patients suffer. I, I want to, in the video, I give a shout out to Dr. Jerry out of Mobile, Alabama. It, it's been like ICD 10 has been his great white whale. He's been obsessed on it. Whenever he comes, he, he just pounds on the problems that the person in small practice will have with ICD-10. And this one year delay, I want to say it is his responsibility. He's the one who got the one year delay in, uh, that TMS recently uh, implemented. And so physicians can make a difference. It just takes time for my practice. It takes having a personal relationship with the person who is serving, the senator or the member of Congress, um, and that's going to take time to develop unless you went to high school or college with them and just happen to know them. But, but there's no substitute for engagement. And in a sense, we've been a little passive, uh, not, not individuals, but as a group, or else we've been represented by groups that have been perhaps not pursuing 
what I would consider the physician's interest, and it shows. A really odd man out. And so everybody else got what they wanted except the patient and us. And uh, first of all, I appreciate, are you doing okay on time, or do you have a, time for a few more questions? Absolutely, I have time for questions. Okay. I think you answered this in your, in your presentation, but I'll just throw it out anyway and give you a further chance to respond. Is there a role for Congress to enact certain measures that might improve EHR certification, safety, efficiency, health information exchange, and along with that widespread acceptance by physicians? Because as you alluded to, if the goal is to have widespread use of these systems, doesn't it make sense to have the end user want to use them? That is so apparent. I wish it had been apparent by the people who wrote the High Tech Act. But it's always assumed that people in Washington know our practices as well as we know our practices. And by the way, let's be honest, there's a few physicians who are early adopters, they're technophiles, they're able to, you know, they whiz through things that others stumble with. And, but they're the ones who gravitate, and they're the ones who kind of, hey, we can do this and we can do that. Now, God bless them. They're good people. They, you know, want the best, but they're not the person seeing 30 patients a day who is trying to make their practice more efficient. Uh, and they're willing to sacrifice a little extra time in order for whatever, whatever benefit they can get from the EHR. So the legislation that I will be putting in on the Senate side will explicitly say that physicians have to be involved in helping to uh, design and implement EHRs going forward. They have to be involved in the standardization so that it works for physicians as well as for the hospital administrator. Um, if there is a message that comes out of this, is that docs have to be involved. And by the way, if folks want to have a Kind of my two, two cents on how to be involved. Let me know if we have time for if, if somebody wants to ask a question or if people are interested in that because there's a strategy of involvement. Can I take a stab at that? This is Mike Karuchak. I'm back in. I had to step out to get a couple of, uh, of patients, but can I take a stab at this what should Congress do thing? Yes. Please. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the less Congress is involved, the better. Um, you know, when we were working on this, you know, our, our practice is very, very successful with EMR. I'm one of those early adopter technophile practices of about uh, uh, 13 doctors that you're mentioning. Um, you know, as an aside, we're as busy as the rest of them. We just spend our time from, you know, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. writing the software and then using it the next day. And before high tech came along, we were ready. I mean, we were ready to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to, to be engaged. And that's what would have happened had high tech not come along. Uh, then the free market would have, uh, you know, exerted appropriate pressures, right? In 2008, only 4% of practices were using MRs. Had we not had high tech, those vendors would have gone to the successful 4% and said, what's your secret? Right? We have 4%, and of those 4%, they're all very, very happy with their EMRs. What is it that they're doing right? What's the secret sauce? And we would have been at that time, and obviously we still are now, we'd have been glad to share. We would have been glad to expand our knowledge, work with the vendors, come up with better products. I approached our vendor in 2008 and said, let's do this. We were, you know, four years downstream from our EMR. We were good enough at it, kind of customized enough to maybe make a, a, an ENT-specific product. And our vendor said, no, we don't have time to talk to you. We have no interest in talking to you because high tech had just come out and all our bandwidth is devoted to compliance rather than innovation. So I think if we got the government out of the way and we got vendors and successful users together in an environment that promotes their cooperation, i.e. free market, I think we would do a whole lot better. So I totally agree with you, Mike. Uh, again, this is Bill speaking. So what yeah. um, uh, my strategy is, is that if we have a private, if, if the private sector comes up with a consortium that uh, will accomplish this, that's great. If the private sector won't do it, then probably the uh, HHS should do it because they can issue rules and, and they can adapt the rules. And if that doesn't happen, then Congress is going to step in. Now, I'm willing for Congress to step in. I just don't want Congress to step in. 
Um, so, but, but by the way, if it takes a club to make it happen, I'm going to swing a club. Yeah. Yeah. The only let thing me ask you, you, Mike. Let me ask you. Yeah. If I'm going to put in legislation which says that there needs to be a consortium of EHR vendors and physicians and nurses and users mm -hmm. to agree yeah. upon standardization, is there anything you would add to that? As a physician, and I'm asking this for my patrol, is there uh -huh. any other kind of how, how would you construct that group so that you would end up with um, uh, something that worked for the doc and the, and the patient? Well, the first thing you need to do is actually bring the vendors to the table in an environment they'd be actually interested in. Right now, the vendors could care less about yeah, what end users exactly want because right. end users aren't the customer. Yeah. The government's the customer. Right now, the vendor's priority are to maintain certification. Right? Every year, the bar gets higher for certification, and every year, it's all the vendor can do to maintain certification. If they fail to maintain certification, they're completely out of the game. Doesn't matter how good their product is, doesn't matter how many end users they've got, and how many good ideas they have. So first thing you have to do is change that environment so that certification is no longer the goal. Usability is the goal. So the first thing you have to do is change that environment so that vendors actually come to the table ready to work with end users. Because right now, so, the high so, then, the, so then the specification for the product should be that a physician would be able to, uh, you help me write the spec. The goal, the outcome we want from this collaboration is that the EHR is integrated into the practice to the degree that the patient can see the patient as efficiently with an EHR, spending as much physical time with the patient as, um, as, as if they had a paper chart. Is that a fair? Uh, that's a reasonable start. I think I would add that, that uh, it, it needs to be a return on investment for the physician's dollar spent. I mean, when we spent all the money on our system, our goal was obviously more efficient care and better care, but, but, the, but you're never going to get there until you make something that is efficient and usable and actually gets your dollar invested back and maybe a time to more. But even if you just get your money back out of it, and, and we have numbers to suggest that we've gotten our money back out of it. We have statistics that document that. Um, but, but you've got to get into the nuts and bolts of how a practice runs so that you can automate certain workflows. I mean, there's this whole workflow science that physicians don't know enough about to really move the ball forward. And so I, I think really instead of standardization, I think I would talk more about usability. Right. Everybody gets okay. hyperventilates yeah. about you know interoperability and data exchange and all that kind of stuff. That's almost trying to ride a bike before you know how to crawl and walk. Yeah. And so okay. I would but, say you need to design products that doctors can actually use and get the value out before you start getting sick. Yeah, and my, and Jim, Michael, uh, Dan Craviota here. Michael, would you agree uh -huh. that part of the problem is is that as physicians and Senator Cassidy too, you're a gastroenterologist. I as an orthopedic surgeon might work a little differently than the cardiologist in terms of how I approach things. And so absolutely. And, and the EHR systems and the developing don't understand that. They really don't. And so I do we need we do need physician inside in some and the problem is as I see it and I might be wrong is that these EHR companies are big companies and so far they have not really listened to us. I don't and so that's why the suggestion that Maybe we need something coming out of Washington that would hold them a little more accountable. How, how about if taking... If you got rid of high-tech incentives, if you got rid of exactly. the use incentives and went exactly. back and said, here's the deal, you're not going to sell another dime's worth of EMR products unless you make doctors happy and patients happy. Make yeah. your, you know, these are your real customers. And, you know, right now, all they care about is getting certified. You know, yeah. I'm not sure that you need to get terribly fancy on the, yeah. you know, I don't know that you need to create a new program. I think I'd be interested to see what happens if you just got rid of the old one so and, what, and turned the culture away from compliance and certification and all these things and got them turning towards value. Yeah, and so what, what you're saying, need. Michael, excuse me to interrupt, what you're saying, and I think yeah. in your talk you mentioned it, this was thrust upon us with the carrot and stick kind of high tech act. And what you're saying, I think, and asking, well, how can we bring the free market back into bear to, to like develop these systems? The uh, how, how can we how how can we do that? But I think that's what you're suggesting, correct? It is. 
Yeah, you, I'm saying, look, I mean, you got to get, I mean, the sunset meaning for you. Just get rid of it. I mean, obviously, right. you can't, you, you've got to, you've got to have an X strategy for it. But I think if you suddenly, if seconds. the healthcare IT industry suddenly realized, oh my gosh, we're on our own. You know, we're, it's not just a matter of jumping through the next government certification hoop and waiting for the orders to come in because the government's forcing them to come in. You know, it's like the first slide of my talk had a picture of an Edsel on it. Right? I don't know how much it's slide you saw. But, you know, the Edsel was a fairly technologically advanced car in 1958. You know, on paper, it was a wonderful machine. In the real world, it was awful. Hey, Michael. If there had been a government, if there had been a government mandate requiring that, Edsel, that everybody buy an Edsel, it would have been the sales success story of the century, and everybody would be patting themselves on the back on a wonderful car. Hey, and Mike. That's what we're looking at with that now. Hey, Michael, I'm going to have to interrupt uh, because we are yeah. out of time, unfortunately. I, we could carry on this conversation. It's, uh, I can tell it's passionate to all of us. But before we leave, I just want to thank, once again, Senator Cassidy. Thank you so much. And uh, like I said earlier, I, I appreciate your service. And it's really uh, almost comforting to know that there's a physician within the United States Senate who understands our uh, our course and our path that we are on as physicians and some of the challenges we have. So thank you so much for joining us today. 